Beautiful. Uh, would y'all take your Bible? We're going to take a short break from the Psalms, and today we're going to be in Acts, Acts 28, beginning in verse 1, the title of our message, The Doorway of Hope. Let's pray and receive from God's Word today. Lord, we are so thankful for your Word. We know that you send it in power by your Holy Spirit. You use it in our lives God, draw us to yourself. Establish our faith on the rock of Jesus Christ. God, meet us here. Pour out your spirit of life through your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. This is about the favor of God in the midst of troubles. And we love the favor of God. It, It is one of the most beautiful aspects of our relationship to God. But what does it actually mean? I think for most people, that favor of God means that God will bless them with the beautiful things of life, grace that they did not deserve. But what many people do not see and often miss is shown to us in this story that God's hand of blessing and favor often come to those who are suffering, those who are going through a storm, those that are going through a difficulty and enduring great troubles. In fact, the The trouble, the distress that they're going through becomes the door of hope, becomes the doorway by which God's favor will be poured out on their life. There are many biblical examples. For example, uh, when Israel entered the land that God promised them, there were some who had turned their back on God and brought trouble on Israel. So they named that place the Valley of Achor, or in Hebrew, the Valley of Trouble. But that's where then you see the grace of God, the favor of God, when later the prophet Hosea declared, this is Hosea chapter 2 verse 15, where God declared through that prophet, I will give the valley of Achor as a door of hope. What a glorious truth is this. The very valley of trouble will become a doorway of hope. And Israel will sing there in that valley as in the days of her youth. What a great truth is this. Many, many scriptural examples. Uh, David. David was anointed to be the future king of Israel. That was the favor of God on his life. And that's also when the difficulties and the challenges arose in his life also. Later, when David was the only one willing to, to, to take on that Philistine giant, When he stepped into the theater of war, God's favor, yet again, was revealed in his life. And you can see it over and over. So many troubles David encountered, but so many times the favor of God came with those troubles. In fact, the troubles became a door by which God's favor was poured out. Then there's Joseph. Now, we love the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, He received a vision from God that he would one day arise uh, in authority and stature uh, to such a degree that his brothers would even like bow down uh, to him in recognition of that authority and stature. But that's the favor of God so beautifully portrayed And that's when also the troubles and the difficulties began. The brothers didn't take kindly to this vision of grandeur and decided to get rid of him by selling him to slave traders. So, sold as a slave uh, in Egypt to Potiphar, who was an official uh, in in Pharaoh's uh, kingdom. Uh, There, again, you see the favor of God. Over and over, the favor of God, even in the midst of the trouble. Then, when Potiphar's wife tried to put the make on him, and he refused... She became a, a, a woman scorned and had him thrown in prison. He went from bad to worse. But then the favor of God was revealed yet again where God had given him this gift of interpreting dreams and God used it in such a way and turn about of events in such a way that, that it got the attention of the Pharaoh who then uh, brought him out of prison and gave him uh, uh, the uh, position in the kingdom because he interpreted his dreams uh, to, to save uh, the kingdom and thus God used it to save Israel. And in fact, his brothers did 
come and bow down to him. But here's what we see. That all of those troubles, all of those difficulties, were the very thing that God used to bring about God's favor. It was the very thing that God used as the doorway of hope. The doorway of God's favor. Do you know where in the world, uh, right now, the church, the gospel is growing fastest and strongest? Where there is revival in the world? Greatest. Iran. There in that place that they are facing the greatest persecution, there is a revival happening. Because God is revealing himself to so many of uh, those who are in Islam. In their dreams, they're having encounters with Jesus Christ. And many are coming by the multiple thousands. There is something happening there. In that place of greatest trouble. That place of greatest persecution. Did you know that almost all of the names of God were revealed to Israel in times of distress. Oh, the, the names of God, of course, uh, uh, are, are the promises that God gives to Israel. All of those are the revealing of who he is. All that I am, I will be to you. And the names of Israel that were given to, uh, uh, names of God that were given to Israel were given in times of distress. Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, all of these beautiful names are the promises of God given to Israel when they needed him most, especially in times of trouble. And then there's Paul. And that's what we're going to look at today, the story of Paul, who was given the privilege of being one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament era, right? More of the New Testament was written by Paul than any other apostle. He was given visions, understanding, uh, um, the anointing, power of God, as amazing favor of God clearly on his life. But yet, Paul suffered greatly. Five times, it says, he received from the Jews 39 lashes. This is with whips. Um, three times he was beaten with rods. These are, these are like metal rods, thick as a man's finger. Three times beaten with rods. Once he was stoned and left for dead. Three times he was shipwrecked. He spent a day uh, or a night and a day in the deep, in other words, in the sea. And yet clearly the favor of God was revealed in his life. And all of those troubles became the doorway by which those favors were, were revealed. Now, after hearing all of that, you might say, well, I'm not sure I want God's favor on my life if it means that. But here's the thing. This world is filled with troubles. Your life will encounter many troubles. And I would rather be in the center of God's will and have the favor of God on my life than anywhere else in the world. Anybody agree with me? Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. He's exactly right. <clears throat> Even if it means difficulties and troubles. Acts 28 is that story. Now, in the previous chapter, chapter 27, uh, we find Paul on a ship in the middle of the Mediterranean. They had been facing a storm for two full weeks. Can you imagine a storm so severe that it endures for two full weeks? The, a, a nor'easter, we would say today. Raging storm. So bad that they threw the ship's cargo overboard. Then they threw the ship's tackle overboard. It says all hope was gradually lost. And then eventually they were shipwrecked on an island. We know it's Malta. And um, that's where we pick up our story. Interestingly, by the way, a few years ago, we were doing a Footsteps of Paul cruise tour. And we were coming into Malta. And the one time that we had bad weather on the ship, the one time we encountered, uh, encountered rough seas was when we were coming into Malta. Like that's the one time you want rough seas. So you can experience, we were all like, we are experiencing the same thing that Paul did. Except we're on a cruise ship. I mean, otherwise, it's the same thing. <laughs> this is a story of how God uses storms and troubles as a doorway of hope. As a door by which the favor of God is revealed in your life. So it says they battled the storm for two full weeks all hope was gradually lost. But then, at near the end of that, Paul stood up in their midst and encouraged them to take courage. 
because God had visited him. An angel had visited with Paul there in the ship and had assured him that he would stand before Caesar and then God had granted safety to all those sailing with him. So Paul stood up. Take up your, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God and it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But first we must run aground on a certain island. And they were encouraged. They took Paul's faith to bear. Now it tells us that about midnight on the 14th day that the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. It's midnight. It's dark. Storm is raging. They take soundings. They found that they were at 20 fathoms, which is 120 feet. A fathom is six feet. They took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms or 90 feet. Now, this is a very important thing, 90 feet. Now, fearing that they might run aground somewhere in the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern, four from the stern, and then they wished for daybreak. Now, when daylight came, they observed a certain bay with the beach and decided to drive the ship onto the beach if they could do it. So cutting off the anchors and leaving them in the sea, this is important, cutting off the anchors, leaving them in the sea, they hoisted the foresail to the wind and headed for the beach. But the ship struck fast on a reef and the waves began to break up the ship from the stern. So they commanded those who could swim to jump overboard and get to land and everyone else followed some on planks and other various things from the ship, and thus they arrived safely. All aboard were safely then on the shore, cold, wet, and exhausted. By the way, when we go to Malta, you, you can go to this very exact place. Now, we know it's the exact place. There's the beach. There's a reef. You can see the waves breaking, breaking over the reef some distance away. And they found four anchors at 90 feet. And interestingly, they, the divers found the first two anchors, didn't know what they had found, and it melted them down for, you know, divers' weights. Then an archaeologist heard about this, came there and said, we must go and find more. There are four. It's right in the story. We know there are four. There will be two more. We must find them. There will be at 90 feet. And they found all four. And so when you go to Malta in the Maritime Museum, they have the anchors of the Roman ships from that era. Isn't that an amazing part of the story? Storms, troubles, difficulties. Do not have to shipwreck your faith. You can trust God to see that in every stormy gale, every difficulty of peril, it becomes the door by which God's favor will be seen in your life. Let's read the story. We're in Acts 28, verse 1. When we had been brought safely through, we found that the island was called Malta. And the natives there showed us extraordinary kindness. For because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled the fire and received us all. Now, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. A poisonous viper latched itself onto Paul's hand. Now, when the natives saw this, this creature hanging from his hand, they began to say to one another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. For although he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Justice has found him out. He's a murderer for certain. However, Paul shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. Now, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to Paul, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously for three days. 
And it came about that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed, he laid hands on him and healed him. And then, after this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to Paul and getting healed. Here, this is amazing, the, the grace of God, the favor of God in the midst of all of this trouble and peril. And then they honored us with many marks of respect. And when we were setting sail, three months later, they supplied us with all we needed. And at the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered on the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead that would be Castor and Paulus. And after we had put in the Syracuse, we stayed there three days. And from there, we sailed around and arrived at Regium. And then a day later, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we arrived at Puteoli. Now, you know that you're getting near to Rome when you come to Puteoli. There we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And thus, we came to Rome. What a great story. Very important story about victorious faith in the storming of the troubles of life. See, what, what do you do? How do you respond to troubles? Especially epic troubles. And I submit that faith will change your perspective on how you see the trouble. It will change how you see it. It will change how you understand it. That the troubles of life, the perils and difficulties become the doorway by which God's favor will be opened. Now the natives, it says, were exceptionally kind uh, and because of the cold, they kindled the fire and Paul was gathering sticks. Now I love that part of the story that Paul is gathering sticks. Paul is being helpful. Servant hearted. I love that part because I love being helpful. Sometimes I'm even too helpful. But there's Paul gathering sticks. He lays them on the fire, and a viper comes out because of the heat and latches onto his hand. How do you respond? It has everything to do with how your faith has a bearing on the trouble. It has everything to do with your perspective. How do you see this thing? In other words, respond with faith. This is the key to victorious life. Respond with faith when troubles come. Now, I think mean, many people... Uh, <clears throat> when they encounter one trouble after another would have been exasperated, frustrated, even angry with God. I think there's a lot of people who would have said, God, how much can a man take? Here I am, I'm serving you, I get attacked by a crowd. See, the, the backstory on this is that Paul was in Jerusalem and uh, a, a, a riot arose and, uh, and they threatened to kill him, so the Romans took him into protective custody. And um, then when they heard there was a plot to kill him, they brought this, him to Caesarea. There he stood in prison for two years, never facing any accusation, never being charged with anything. Finally, he uh, appeals to Caesar, and so they put a Roman uh, centurion over him and put him on a ship, which is why he encountered the storm. So here's Paul. Can you imagine? One trouble after the other. God, how much can a man take? I, here I am. I'm trying to serve you. I get attacked by a crowd. They take me into custody. They put me in prison for two years, never bringing a charge against me. Finally, I have to appeal to Caesar. They put me on a ship. And then what should happen? We encounter a storm for two raging weeks. Then we get into a shipwreck. And now this? I get beaten by a, bitten by a viper? How much can a man take? And I think a lot of people would have been angry. But that, not Paul. See, that's not his response at all. He gets bitten by the viper. And he calmly shakes it off into the fire. Because God had assured him that he would stand before Caesar and he believed God. See, when you've been through as many storms and as many difficulties as Paul, it begins to change your perspective. You begin to see that God's favor is revealed through the trouble. It's a doorway of hope. It's a doorway for that favor to be revealed. It will change how you see the trouble itself. <clears throat> a lot of people, if a viper latched onto their hand, would have panicked. I would have. Poisonous snakes and vipers tend to produce that reaction. I myself, I can't stand snakes. 
I remember one time when I was 15, we had visited relatives in Arkansas, and we were down by the Buffalo River, and someone pointed out, oh, there's a baby water moccasin, which you know are very poisonous, you know. And I don't know, something arose in me, like this fear uh, thing arose. I mean, I grew up in Oregon. We don't have poisonous things in Oregon. At least not in the good part of Oregon. <clears throat> and then I saw this snake and like, oh, this thing rose up in me. And I, I took this rock, you know, and I s smashed it. Oh, no, I wasn't done. That, that wasn't enough. I took another st uh, rock and I just kept smashing this thing until we had viper soup. I mean, there was a reaction. I can't stand the, the, the thought of the snake, you know. But not Paul. He was told that he's going to stand before Caesar. He believes God. He trusts that God is going to keep his word. See, this is where the troubles of life will actually strengthen faith. They can strengthen faith. For when you've been through troubles and then seen God's favor in the midst of that trouble, you come to learn that both things are true. Troubles will come. Life is filled with troubles, but so will God's favor. In fact, the trouble becomes the door by which God's favor will be revealed. Troubles bring favor. Troubles will bring favor. Troubles will bring favor. It will change your perspective. For in the next time you encounter trouble, you will begin to watch for God's favor. It will strengthen your faith. The more troubles you've been through, the more you've seen God's favor in the midst of the trouble, the greater the trouble and problems that you can face victoriously. There's an old saying that the measure of a man or a woman is the size of the problems that he can face victoriously. Now, there's an interesting part of the story. Uh, when they were in the midst of this uh, raging storm in the Mediterranean, it tells us that at one point they set down the sea anchor. Now what is a sea anchor? It's not a weighted anchor that you would drag behind the ship. They're in the middle of the Mediterranean. No, a sea anchor is an underwater sail and it has the effect of keeping the ship steady in the storm but it also keeps the bow of the ship facing the waves and the wind which is a great point. If you are encountering a storm, if you're encountering a difficulty, face this thing head on. Face this thing straight on with victorious faith. Let me give you some great scriptures. Psalm 112. We were looking at this a few weeks ago. Love Psalm 112. It's one of the great ones. And notice verse 1 and verse 7. For here we see that very thing. It says, how blessed is the man, how blessed is the man who reveres the Lord, who honors God in his life, who greatly delights in his commands. Notice that. That is the, the relationship that he has of honor, respect God in his life. This is the one, it says, that he will not fear bad news. This is such a key verse. This one who reveres and honors God, he will not be afraid of bad news. For his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld, and he will not fear. That is victorious faith. Then there's this in Psalm 138, verses 3 and then 7 and 8. Note, I love this verse. You made me bold with strength in my soul. That's what God wants to do. That is what victorious faith is. God, you did it. You made me bold with strength in my soul. And though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. I know my God. I know how he moves. We will encounter troubles, but I will not be afraid of that. He says, I know my God. I know that he will revive me. For your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me today. For your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Notice that part. For your loving kindness is everlasting. This is in the midst of a verse talking about troubles. I know this, that your loving kindness 
is eternal. See, this is important because many people, when they encounter deep troubles, great difficulties, they doubt God's love. God, I don't understand. You say you love me. If you love me, then why am I in this storm? If you love me, then why am I encountering this trouble? You say you love me? And they begin to doubt. That's not victorious faith. That's not Paul. See, Paul is convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. See, he was convinced that was the foundation of Paul's faith. That God's love is everlasting. That nothing can separate us. No trouble or difficulty can separate us. No, God's love is still there. In fact, he writes this in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 35 and then 37 and 39. Now, you might know that Romans is one of the, I mean, capstone uh, books of the New Testament. Absolutely glorious. And of the chapters in Romans, chapter 8 stands out as a tremendous highlighted capstone of chapters. And then in chapter 8, these verses have got to be one of the great ones. Notice what Paul says. Who, and you might even say what, will separate us from the love of Christ? Like he, let's make this clear. He says, who or what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will that separate you from the love of Christ? Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Many who encounter such things would doubt God's love. But, but Paul writes, no. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that is a great verse. That is victorious. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Victorious. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> what a powerful perspective. What a powerful understanding that no matter what distress or persecution or peril that Paul is going through, he had every assurance that he was abiding in God's love and therefore if he is in God's love that he's in God's favor and that it will become a doorway of hope now what's the worst that can happen I think when you're going through a trouble or a difficulty it's good to ask the question what is the worst that can happen well what is the worst I could lose my life they could take my life that's the worst that's the worst. I think we need a different view of the thing. To die without the hope of Jesus Christ, that's the worst. But when you have the promise and the hope of Jesus Christ, death is not the end. No, death is a glorious beginning. It's coronation day. It's graduation day. It's the day you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. That's what that is. You know, God will give you perfect peace. For those who trust in him. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil for thou art with me. I know my God that he is with me. Even though peril of such a, a way that I don't know if I will live. Oh I know my God. I know that it is graduation day. I will not fear. Amen. Now I had I, I, I want my own encounter with this. I mentioned this before but I think it, it's important to say it again. Many of you know that I've been struggling with my voice. And the last couple of years have been quite a struggle. Uh, I'm learning now. But when this first happened, I went, of course, to the doctors. And they did all of these things and sent me to the specialist uh, who said, I think that you have ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. And, and it's the type, it's the worst type that if, if you have it, you won't live more than two years. 
And he says, but we need to test. So he's going to send, I'm going to send you the specialist who specializes in it, and he's going to do all these tests. So it took two months to get in to see him. So for two months, I had this hanging over me that I very likely had ALS, and I couldn't say anything because I, I didn't know for certain until the tests were done. And I had this over me for two months. And I tell you what, it was two months of perfect peace. It was for me an encounter to know that God is with me in the midst of trouble. And I know my God, and I tell you what, I had perfect peace. Oh, I'm so thankful. That's when you know when your faith is real. Now, it turned out, when I went to see the specialist, he said, no, you don't have ALS. Said, oh, praise God for that. <laughs> he said, but you do have a trouble that you'll have the rest of your life. But I tell you what, I have learned to adapt and I am sounding, or at least I hope so, I think I'm sounding better than I've sounded in a long time. So praise God for that. <clears throat> I have seen the favor of God over and over and over. I could write a book on the ways that I have seen the, the, the favor of God, even in the storms and the difficulties of life. God will use those difficulties in your life. I remember a personal story. Many of you know that God called me to be a pastor when I was young. And God amazingly revealed his favor on my life when he miraculously provided for me to be able to go to Bible college at Multnomah University and later Western Seminary to prepare, you know, to become a, a pastor. It was absolutely miraculous. A fellow came to me one day and says, hey, God, put it on my heart that I'm going to pay your way to Bible college. It was a miracle. But there it was. Then I'm now I'm in Bible college going through uh, this, the time of, of study and preparation, and it was actually a very difficult time. I had a full load of classes. I would often get only four or five hours sleep a night because of the studies. I know. I had two jobs. I know. My children were babies, and, <laughs> and they needed a lot of attention. But over and over, the favor of God. So my, uh, my former partner in the restaurant came to me and he said, hey, I have a question. I have a favor. Could you take one year off of school and help me open this new restaurant? You know all the systems. I need you to just for one year, I will pay you very, very well. Take a year off. Help me open the restaurant and go back. And I thought, you know... This could be a, a, a help. I mean, we were struggling just to make, you know, groceries. And I thought, this could be good. You know, life was really hard. And I thought, yeah, I could save a lot of money. I could save a lot of that money. And, and then life would be easier. But I thought, you know, I really should talk to my friend who God used to provide miraculously. So I sat with him and I told him the whole thing and I said, here's, here's what I'm asked. You know, take a year off. He's going to pay me really, really well. I can save a lot of money and life would be easier. So he said, well, let's consider it. Did, did you say that this was about money? I go, well, yeah. And he said, well, then no, you don't understand. God will always provide for you. And of course, he was living proof of that. He was a miracle of God. So, I see. And then he said, and then, I, I, did you say that this would make life easier? Of course, yeah, I did say that, although I was beginning to regret saying that. <laughs> and yes. And he said, well, did you ever consider that maybe God doesn't want life easier for you? Actually, no, I never thought of that. <laughs> Never occurred to me, actually. And he said, maybe God is using the difficulty. of it. Maybe God will use that as preparing for you. You want, you're going, you want to be a pastor? You're going to school to be a pastor? You think being a pastor is easy? God is using the difficulty as part of the preparing. I think you should not do the easy thing. Don't take any time off. In fact, don't take any time off at all, even in the summer. Press through. Do the hard thing. I'm paying for it. Do the hard thing. And I thought, you know what, God? You're right. 
Thank you for using this man to speak a word in my life. You're right. I'm going to do the hard thing. Took the hardest classes. Even took two Greek classes at once. I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to take this ship and I'm going to point it right straight into the wind. By faith, God will be with me. Amen? Amen. See, you see this, the people on the island, they had never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here, in the midst of all this trouble and peril and difficulty, God's favor. God gave a testing miracles to Paul, kept him from harm from the viper. Many people are being healed. God's favor over the, the peril became the doorway of hope, the doorway by which God's favor was revealed. Keep looking for God's favor. Trust God's love over you, no matter what trouble you are going through. Oh, the grace of God. You, you go through so many perils, you begin to watch for it. I believe God. For the favor of God is because of his great love for you. Now, it's interesting that it was a viper that latched itself onto Paul's hand. A viper, or serpent, has represented the enemy from the very beginning, the curse of sin. But here's the thing, in Jesus Christ, those who have Jesus Christ have taken hold of the promise of eternal life and the promise of, of, of sin paid in full, the curse of sin is broken and it is broken eternally. The enemy of your soul has a grip on many people's lives and many people have been destroyed by it. But the curse of sin is broken for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. The grip and the power of the enemy has been defeated. So that we can confidently say, See, this is the key. So that we can confidently say, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, Oh, death, where is your victory? So that we can confidently say, Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a glorious verse right there. Amen. So when the viper took hold of Paul's hand, they concluded that he must be a murderer and that justice had found him out. Now that's an interesting part of the story. And many do think this way. And, and frankly, there is some truth of it. There is some truth to it in that sense that, you know, what goes around comes around. You might say descriptions to that. There's some truth to that. I, I was thinking of a humorous illustration. Some years ago, when we, we used to live in a home that was very close to the church. And one day, it's a nice warm day, kind of like this, uh, my wife Jordy was walking to the church with one of our daughters. And as they're walking, uh, they found a snake. And uh, so my wife picked up the snake, and she says, oh, I know what, let's do. <laughs> let's bring this to the church. And let's bring this to dad. And let's sneak up on him and put the snake down his shirt. Now that's a great thing to teach your kids to do. I say sarcastically. So she's carrying this, uh, you know, big snake, and she's bringing it uh, to the church. You know, she comes up to the offices, and there I am in my office, studying God's word. Yeah. And she opens the door, you know, and I got my back to the door, and so she's sneaking up, you know, like this. And I'm oblivious, right? And, she's st and then she starts to put it down my neck, down the back of my shirt, exactly. And I'm like, oh, I reacted. Well, the snake apparently didn't like it either because the snake whipped around and bit her on the hand. <laughs> which I thought, serves you right. <laughs> For what goes around, <laughs> comes around. And then she, you know, like, oh, that made her freak out. She flipped the, you know, flicked the snake, went flying, you know. So then I had to go find the snake who's not happy anymore. And, you know, take it out. But the great truth for believers is that the curse has been broken, that we have been set free. That because of the favor of God in your life, 
the enemy's grip has been broken. In fact, it says what Paul wrote to the church at Rome, Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, another glorious set of verses from Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You have been set free from the law of sin and death. See, because of his great love, he took that condemnation on himself. That which we deserved, the brunt of that condemnation, fell upon him. That is why the favor of God is on your life. Because he took it all. The brunt of it fell on him. It, we deserved it, but it fell on him. That's why the favor of God is revealed in your life. I was thinking of an illustration of that. A number of years ago, uh, <clears throat> we were doing some work here in the sanctuary, really high up in the lights, and so we have this extension ladder. It's really, really tall. And uh, they, when they had finished, I was putting the extension ladder away. Now, you might know an extension ladder, many of you do know, it's really two ladders in one. You have the base ladder, and then you have this upper ladder with a pulley and a rope, and you know, you pull it up, and it click, 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 way high. And so they had finished their work, and so I, I had a hold of the ladder, and I was going to put it away because I'm trying to be helpful. <laughs> and I'm, I'm lowering down this upper ladder, but the rope slipped out of my hand. And the upper ladder came crashing down onto my hand. But it didn't even hurt. And I thought, what? I mean, that should have broken my hand. But I looked like, what, what was that? And then I realized what had happened. I had a hold of the rung of the ladder like this. And I, as I gripped the ladder, it pushed my ring like this. So when the ladder came down, it came down right on that ring. My ring, my wedding ring, her love took it all. <laughs> but what a great illustration. Because of his great love, he took it all. It all fell on him. We deserved it, but it did not fall on us. It fell on him, and because of his great love, now the doorway of hope and the doorway of favor has been opened in your life. But here's where it must become personal. Faith must be your own. You must have your own faith. Each person, has. you have your own journey your own set of troubles. Everyone here has their own set of troubles. But God wants your faith to arise, to believe that every trouble and difficulty is a door of hope, is a doorway by which God's favor would be revealed if you would only watch, if you would only believe. It must become personal. There comes a point when each person must declare it, I believe. I believe in what God has done for me through his son, Jesus Christ. I believe because of his love that Jesus took on the cross that which I deserved. But it did not fall upon me. It fell upon him. And that became a doorway of hope, a doorway of favor. I had now have a relationship to the Lord God Almighty. I believe. I will now believe that he will be with me on this journey of life and that every trouble and every peril and every difficulty will be a door of hope, a door by which God's favor will be revealed in my life. I believe. There comes a time to make it personal. Your own personal faith cannot rest on the faith of anyone else. You cannot rest on the faith of your spouse. The rest of, you cannot rest on the faith of your parents. Each one must have his own personal faith. I believe is the declaration of the heart. I believe. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for you. 
how you have revealed the greatness of your love. That that which we deserved to fall upon us, it fell upon him. He took it all. So that we could have life, eternal life, forgiveness of sin, relationship to the Almighty, our Father. That the favor of God would be poured out upon our lives. God, we believe that even the troubles and the difficulties of life become a door of hope, a door by which your favor will be revealed. I believe Church Hamdi today would make that declaration to the Lord, I believe. Would you just raise your hand and make that declaration? Raise both hands if you want. I believe. God, I trust in all that you are doing. God, I believe that the troubles and the perils and the difficulties are a door of hope. A door by which your favor will be revealed. I believe. Father, we love you and honor you and thank you. In Jesus' powerful name, and everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor?